And finally, we got the call saying that we'd won and uh, that we were going to, you know, be the opening band for Bon Jovi. Going there, playing the shows, they were freaking awesome. They were like 50,000 people in Sydney Football Stadium, which is what it was called at the time. And man, the sound the audience makes, <laughs> there's nothing to compare it to. We were like so broke and we couldn't afford a hotel and you can get like a $1 burger or a $1 sandwich. And we get that and we'd cut them in half so that there was enough to go around. <laughs> it was then that I kind of had like a bit of an epiphany and I was like, imagine doing this, but having money to do it. And even though they've done their homework correctly and checked all the boxes, it still doesn't go the, the way we think it's going to go. And that's just the market. That's just how it works. And, and now I'm kind of like, I could say that I'm just as passionate about music as I am about investing. Welcome to Not The Rob Bell Podcast, where we talk with business owners, marketers, and professionals to extract what makes people and businesses successful. Hey everyone, and thanks for tuning in to Not The Rob Bell Podcast. Today's guest, I've got Nick Roberts, author of The Rockstar Investor. We talk about traveling the road as an actual rock star, investing wisely, and so much more. It's coming up now. So Nick Roberts, the rock star investor, thanks so much for coming on the podcast today. Thanks for having me, mate. And we it's managed- a good spot you got here. Thank you. Love and, it, it. and it's really cool we did manage to get you in the studio. It doesn't happen quite so much at the moment, but uh, yes. But no, it's really cool. So uh, you've obviously got a book out, The Rockstar Investor, and uh, doing some really cool things there. And we'll get to that shortly. Cool. But uh, I really want to sort of go wind the clock back a little bit. And because I know uh, you're actually the uh, the front man for your band October Rage. Yes. But one of your claims to fame is that you opened for Bon Jovi uh, back in about 2010, if I'm not wrong there. Yeah, no, that's correct. Yeah. Yep. So uh, I think there's a pretty cool story there. Can can you give us a <laughs> bit of a, a rundown of how that came about? Yeah. So uh, I, I started that band with my brother, Will, and um, we were kind of semi-serious to begin with. Uh, but then we eventually decided, hey, this is actually a really cool avenue. We want to do this professionally. It'll get us attention from girls and all the rest. <laughs> so we were like, yeah, let's definitely do it. And it wasn't too long into our career when we heard this ad for this radio competition where your band could be the one that plays in front of Bon Jovi, in front sure. of 50,000 screaming fans. And we were like, okay, well, you know, what, what could possibly go wrong? Let's just submit and see what happens. And then eventually we got a call and it said that you're in the top five uh, for the public vote. And that was kind of like, you know, if you get to that final stage, then it's up to public vote. You've got to get all your fans to vote. And if you win that final round, then you're the band. Nice. And so we were like, okay. So for the last, for the next two weeks, we just didn't sleep. And we just went absolutely just great guns, just going like spamming everyone we knew. We spammed letterboxes. We just like, you know, started all these Facebook chats and everything. And finally we got the call saying that we'd won and uh, that we were going to, you know, be the opening band for Bon Jovi, which who at the time in 2010 was the largest uh, grossing live performer, I think. Um, so that was like, you know, we get to jump on one of the biggest tours briefly for, you know, for that whole year. Awesome. And uh, so, yeah, we were so stoked. And then obviously going there, playing the shows, they were freaking awesome. They were like 50,000 people in Sydney Football Stadium, which is what it was called at the time. And man, the sound the audience makes <laughs> when you get them excited is just, you can't, there's nothing to compare it to. It's like that scene in Gladiator where he like describes what it's like inside the, the Coliseum, the you know. The absolute roar of the crowd. Yeah, and it rises up like a storm and that kind of stuff. Um, so that's kind of what it was like. And then we got to meet the band and meet John and, and uh, everyone. And man, he is a humble dude. Like he is so cool. Um, and he was like full of all this like friendly advice. He was like, yeah, come get a photo for like a promo op and that sort of stuff. Yep. We were like, wow, this is really cool. And if I wasn't so starstruck, I probably would have remembered half of what he said <laughs> um, because this is so cool and so down to earth. And I wasn't expecting that, um, but it's cool. And it kind of inspired me. Like if I ever get to that level, that's how I want to be. I want to be humble. I want to be down to earth. I want to be like relatable, you know? Yep. Um, and so from there, it just kind of took off. We like made good friends with the crew and the crew were really awesome people. Like they were just so cool. And they were like, you know, you should come to the States. We've got some people who can help you out with like a smaller tour, you know, off your own bat kind of thing. And we're like, yeah, okay, we'll definitely do that. And so we did. And that's what got us into United States. And from there, we just 
hit the road and never stopped kind of thing. That's cool. But yeah. I, I did wonder about how you got to the States uh, and we'll, we'll touch that in a second, but w- was there anything that you kind of picked up, uh, you know, recognizing that, that John Bon Jovi is like really humble and cool and, uh, and just really smooth. Was that sort of surprising uh, or, or was there, I don't know, a bit of life education of, you know, what it's actually like to be a successful rock star? Yeah, I kind of did think that, like, it gave me hope that it wouldn't change me if I did get that success. Like, I've always thought that, you know, absolute power corrupts and all these <laughs> kind of things. And like, man, I hope I can, you know, stay on the ground if that ever does take off. And it kind of gave me a little bit of hope knowing that that is a possibility because he's just, he's all about, service and he's all about people like he's got these awesome soup kitchens and stuff in the states where nice. you just go there and pay what you can afford and yep. if you can't afford anything then it's free and it's just like he's a philanthropist and all these other things and he's just so helpful and that was the biggest part that I thought was the most inspiring because like if I can be in a position to do that then you know that'll make my whole life, you know, that, that'll be the epic moment where I can just be like, yeah, that's why I'm here. I'm here to give back and I'm here to, you know, provide value and to serve others and that sort of stuff. That's and, really cool. Yeah. And, yeah. and cause certainly like John Bon Jovi's had a, you know, like what 40 year career in, uh, you know, in, uh, in music now. And mm. so certainly some interesting lessons that, that can be learned there. Yes. So you guys decided to kick off a, a US tour. And uh, there's probably a few expectation versus reality moments there. <laughs> yeah. um, can you can you give us a bit of a rundown about that experience? Yeah, so uh, it, it kind of started off like we thought like, oh, this is going to be great. Like, you know, the expectation, you see those memes on Facebook where it's like expectation and it's like crowds and girls and all this kind of <laughs> crazy stuff going on. But reality is it's like, you know, five dudes just sitting there on their phones, just bored out of their minds. <laughs> um, but really what kind of... Uh, the best, like the, the short version is that when we did hit the road, we had shows to start with, but then they kind of dried up and we ended up with kind of no money. Uh, we were living in our van for a while in, in uh, Los Angeles and there were six of us with our gear all packed inside this van, uh, kind of camped by the beach. And we were like so broke and we couldn't afford a hotel. We were so broke that we would go to the, like the McDonald's or whichever restaurant there is. And they have these, like these $1 menus. Sure. Yeah. And you can get like a $1 burger or a $1 sandwich. And we get that, we cut them in half so that there was enough to go around. (laughs) And I just remember feeling like, man, this is just, this isn't how it's meant to be. Like I was totally thinking it would be something completely different. Sure. And it was then that I kind of had like a bit of an epiphany and I was like, imagine doing this, but having money to do it, that would totally change the game because then, you know, we could get a big tour bus and we could, you know, go on tour with whoever we wanted and we didn't have to, you know, play these little shows that no one cares about and no one comes to. And so that was the kind of like the moment where I'm like, well, I could just pack it in and go home or I could just stick it out and see where this goes. And, you know, here we are all these years later and still doing it, still touring from time to time. Not as much now, obviously, there's yeah, sure. COVID and everything, but um, but still a lot of fun. Just finished writing a new album and, man, just it's exciting. Um, but, yeah, it, it, we didn't think that anything was going to happen like that when we, we were in that spot and we were just like, well, you know, how we get out of this mess. Like they're just like, it seems hopeless. Um, so that's a far cry from what we expected, obviously at first. <laughs> and cause there were a few challenges along the way that weren't that long ago. I know you guys had a, uh, your tour bus broken into, yeah. uh, you had <laughs> the engine catch fire. Yep. Uh, that, I think that was in the same year. Yes, it was. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, dealing with uh, you know, South Dakota cops and yeah. uh, and, and a yeah. few other uh, things. I, I think I did see a photo where there was maybe five police cars pulled over your, your yeah, bus on the side of the highway. Yeah, they searched the whole thing, man. That, yeah. So we were going to the Sturgis Motorcycle Rally. Cool. And uh, we were due to play there and we were really excited and we almost made it. And then this cop pulls me over and I'm the guy driving the bus at the time. So I'm like, oh, you know, what's going on here? He's like, you got to step out of the vehicle, man. And we're like, okay. And so he has me in his cop car and he's <laughs> writing this report and like, okay, you're in here because your windshield is, or your windscreen is, is busted. Um, and it's, you know, you got to get that replaced. So here's a written warning. No, fine. Just a warning. All good. I'm like, 
okay, cool. So, and then he's like, so do you mind if we search the bus and are we going to find anything if we search it? And we keep like a pretty clean ship because, you know, we are from another country sure, and yeah. you know, we could get deported if we do the wrong thing. So we are just like, okay, let's just, you know. Banged up abroad appearance probably wasn't in your uh, Exactly. Yeah. So we, uh, we keep it pretty tidy. So I was like, yeah, it's cool. Whatever, you know, go ahead and and search it. Oh, there is a shotgun on the bus, uh, just so you know. <laughs> and he's like, yeah, it's cool. We, we, you know, we're it's cool with the Second yeah. Amendment, whatever. Um, and so anyway, the, all these cops just start pulling up and pulling up. And there's like, yeah, about five cop cars. And they all get on there and they're just tearing the place apart. And we're like, even though we're innocent, we're still freaking out because like, what if they find something and that they think, think it's weird? Yeah, sure, it's yeah. just. And so um, they, they get off the bus and they're like, come over here for a second. I'm like, oh, here we go. So I walk over to this guy and he's like, um, so we found something on the bus. And I was like, oh, what is it? And he's like, you've got this drawer full of posters. Would you mind signing one for me? And I was like, oh, all right. Yeah, no, that's fine. That's fine. Absolutely. So we gave him all the free poster. We signed them all and they were really, really cool. And they were like, man, that's the tidiest tour bus we've ever searched. Nice. I was like, all right, that feels good. Check. Yeah. So uh, it could have been way worse, but. Yeah, that's just one of many things, like all these little holdups, like, yeah, tour bus catching fire at one point. Um, we were driving through construction and uh, just tons of smoke coming out the back. All these trucks are going past, flashing their lights at us, like, dude, you got to pull Someone's over. Dying. Yeah, that's it. And uh, eventually there was flames and everything, and we kind of <laughs> had to abandon it for a little while and uh, send somebody back to come and get it. Wow. But, yeah, it was just like everyone's freaking out and no one knows what to do. And, um, yeah, we had to get somebody to pick us up so we could go and finish our tour. And well, we did. And we had like a lot of the, the, the best thing about the States is the people like they gave us so much extra support. Like We had friends that bailed us out of tough spots like I don't know how many times. Awesome. And so like we can just like absolutely thank those people. We can't thank them enough because they just – they are just, they will bend over backwards. Like that's phrase Southern hospitality that they have over there. Yeah. That's probably true in most places in America. Like sure. it's just awesome. So uh, yeah, we, uh, we're we very thankful and, and we'll, we can't wait to go back there, man. It's an awesome spot. That's very cool. Mm. One thing I'm curious about uh, having some interesting sort of, you know, rock star aspirations as a teenager was uh, like you mentioned Sturge just before, which uh, for anyone listening who's not aware is a massive, massive motorcycle event that happens. Uh, is it Nevada? It's in uh, South Dakota. South Dakota. Yeah. So, uh, and so that was obviously a massive event and it's probably comparable to say big day out just with motorbikes. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much. Yeah. So like they basically take over the whole town. It's not a huge town, but it's just the town is built for the event. And so there's like all these different like fairgrounds and like stages that are permanently set up. Nice. Um, and uh, it's just huge. Like, and there's so many bikes and there's like the sound, man, the sound is awesome. So just like walking around town and just like seeing so many bikes, you've never seen that many bikes in your whole life. And I think last time I went there, they recorded about 2 million bikes come through town. Wow which is just insane. And I, I don't ride. I'm, I'm not very coordinated. <laughs> sure. Uh, but I love looking at them and I love the sound that they make. And yep. I'm just like, man, it was just so cool. But the the whole atmosphere is awesome because it's just this one big party vibe and it's throughout the whole town. You can grab a beer and walk across the street and no one's going to bother you. It's just like... It certainly yeah. sounds like an experience. What was it like playing something like Sturgis and how does that contrast to, say, you know, just a, a small backyard pub yeah so it's very similar um you just have to make sure that you cater for the people that are watching you so like bikers obviously they have a certain style that is you know different from your typical like 21 year old female audience sure. member so we just have to make sure that the set was really energetic and really like kind of like the performance was really visceral kind yep. of thing um but other than that like it was still like you know, business as usual. Um, they were awesome. Like just, we got a really good response and yeah, it, it was just as fun as any other gig really. Um, just the fact that you're in Sturgis and it's like, yeah, this is actually pretty cool. There's bikes around it. I don't get to play and yeah, it's awesome. So that's cool. Yeah. But so in parallel to this rock star journey, uh, you, kicked off a bit of a, an investing career. And I understand you worked for an investing company at, at one point. Can yes. you give us a bit of a rundown on that? Yeah, yeah. So uh, when I first started investing, I started doing like a lot of options trading and that sort of stuff. Kind of learnt from my dad. 
um, I used to pester him. He was in his study, you know, just working away. And I'd be like, what's this book, dad? What's this book? What's this book? And uh, eventually he gave me one and it was the uh, Robert Kiyosaki's Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Good book. And I, it was awesome. I've read it like five times now. Um, but he was like, yeah, read this, see what you think of it. And so I read it and I was like, I think I caught a bit of a bug when I read it because I read something in there about like passive income and assets and that sort of stuff. And I was like, I got to get involved in this. And so, and that was just coming out of high school. So even before my music career was taking off, I was getting involved into this. And so even though I put the investing stuff on hold when we went on tour and that sort of stuff, when I came back, it was somewhere around maybe 2014, 15-ish. We were taking a break from the road and I uh, started doing a lot more trainings and a lot more like classes and that sort of stuff because... So this like, is self-education? This is self-education. Yeah. And, and so to start with, um, I was not educated at all. I was just trading and, and doing what I'd read out of books. Sure. Um, and it was working until I decided to get really, really impatient um, because <laughs> I was like, no, 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 I want to be super rich and then like get a really nice tour bus, you know. Um, and of course, I got really, really impatient, started making a few, you know, dumb decisions and uh, got the margin call on my account, which is when the broker says, dude, uh, you're overexposed on this account and if you don't you know take care of these trades or top up your account with more cash I'm shutting your trades down and of course I didn't have anything with which to do so so I was like ah bummer um, and so <laughs> that was kind of like a painful lesson and no one wants to get that call as a trader or uh, an investor um, but to me it was kind of like a wake-up call like you really need to figure out exactly what it is you're doing and so I started taking a lot more classes and started taking it you know really really seriously and it was about that time when I started, I signed up with this uh, prop trading firm in uh, Sydney. And uh, prop trading is basically when you trade company money. Like it's not yours, it's theirs. Sure. And uh, hopefully you don't lose it. And thankfully <laughs> I didn't. But um, what they do is if you make a profit for that month, they give you like 80% of the profits. Like it's a really, really good sure. you know, deal. Um, and so they've got all these traders on the trading desk and I would go down there and I would trade. And uh, from there, it kind of gave me like this huge bout of confidence because if I can trade with other people's money with leveraged instruments, like things like Forex and options and, you know, all these other kinds of things, then I could do anything. And so after doing that, I started to get some people that were like, dude, will you teach me? And I at first was like, no. No, no, no. I, I couldn't teach. Like, I don't even like teaching people how to play guitar or sing. Like, I just, I'm just <laughs> not a fan of that. Um, but after a while, like, more and more people started asking. And then some people were like, well, you trade company money. Do you want to trade my money? And I was like, actually, that's a pretty good feeling. Like, people beating down my door asking me if I'll trade their money. Like, I guess that's kind of cool, you know. Sure. Um, but it wasn't until I went back on the road and was still just like – I, you couldn't shut me up about it. Like people would be like, you know, I, I want to talk about, you know, my favorite hair metal band and I wanted to talk about investing. Like it was just like I got the bug back and it was just huge now and ever. And and, and now I'm kind of like I could say that I'm just as passionate about music as I am about investing. Yep. Um, so, yeah, it's just like that's kind of how that started and it was just conversations. It was just talking to people and I didn't really want at first to – be like a, a stock market guru or anything. I still don't think I am, but I, that's kind of like, I didn't, that, that's not the path that I wanted to be on. Um, you know, cause then I might have to talk on a stage, heaven forbid. <laughs> um, singing on stage is fine, but you know, when I get up there and start talking, like, you know, what if I, what if my stutter gets bad or what if my dyslexia gets bad or sure, whatever it yeah. is? And I was just like, I, I can't, I can't do it. I'm not going to do that. But then when I started to hear stories about people's like their pension funds or their retirement accounts, just like taking big dives because people doing dumb stuff on Wall Street, I was like, well, I, OK, maybe I maybe I should help. Uh, and then if I remember back to Bon Jovi being inspiring, I was like, well, he exists to serve. Why don't I just help other people make it less about me? And so now it's kind of a lot different because like, you know, this situation here or there's microphones and there's cameras and that sort of stuff. I would have freaked out at that previously, you know, sure. that whole idea. Like I think most people would like, you know, they'd rather get shot by a firing squad than <laughs> do any kind of public speaking. 
Um, but for me, it was uh, once I started to think, oh, it's for other people. It's not about me. Then all that stuff just melts away and you just, you don't think about it anymore. Um, so, yeah, that, that kind of made the decision like, ah, maybe I should help people out with this too. That's pretty cool. Yeah. And so that, that obviously led to uh, writing the book, The Rockstar yes. Investor. Yes. Was there a, a, a sort of a, a pinnacle moment where you sort of recognised that there was an opportunity there and this was something that you were going to commit to and like, right, now I'm going to write it? Yeah. I, at first, I didn't want to write the book at all because I thought this is going to require so much focus and I don't have focus, like, you know, I, I can't do this. Um, but then obviously that's, you know, a terrible voice in the back of the head that's just, you know, all exclu all excuses are lies. So I, I sat down and I was just bit by bit, time at a time, like before we'd hit the road that morning, I would write a bit of the book. And I don't really know what I wanted the book to do or what I wanted it to be or what it, what it was even going to be called. I just knew that it was in there and I was like, well, if I just tap into that creative part that writes songs, maybe I can use that to write a book that makes a bit of sense. Um, and so, yeah, at first, to answer your question, uh, I I didn't want to do it. I hated the idea. And, um, like, if you were to ask me to write another one, I would probably again go, no, <laughs> no, I'm not going to do it, um, even though I keep thinking about what the next one's going to be anyway, so it'll probably happen. Sure. Um, but it was, wasn't until... I think around uh, like 2018 that I really started to think, okay, I've got the time to sit there and write. I'll do it. And because we weren't on tour at the time and I didn't really have much else going on because I was in the States but not touring and I was on a, a visa where you're not allowed to work. It's only music stuff. So I was like, sure. okay, I've got to do something while I'm here. <laughs> so that's what I started doing. And um, once I started to write and it started to get a bit of flow going, then I couldn't stop. And I was like up to a point where I was writing like 2,000, 3,000 words a day and I started to actually really enjoy it and started to see what potential it might have. Um, so yeah, it wasn't too long before I kind of got a little bit of a bug for that as well. Not as much as the other stuff, but sure. yeah, it's still really Cause good. I've read a little bit of your book and, uh, and I, I really like, I can see your personality come through in it where, nice. <laughs> uh, you know, you're using song titles, uh, you know, to kind of like well-known chapters. Song. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And yeah. I think, uh, do you think that, uh, your songwriting history has sort of played a part in assembling that book in a in an entertaining kind of way? I think so um, because here's the thing. When you're talking about shares and investing and all this kind of stuff, like to most people that's really boring. Like it is not a sexy topic because it's like when I start talking about chart patterns and, <laughs> you know, market fundamentals and all this other stuff, a lot of people would just be like, oh, I'll zone out for a second here. Let's let somebody else handle this. Like, I don't want to be in charge of this. It's boring. Um, so you, you kind of got to explain it in a way that's kind of like relatable and fun and entertaining and that sort of stuff. So in the book, obviously, if you've read a little bit, I talk about how investing is like driving a car. Um, like you decide how much danger you're in at any given time. It's not the car that decides that it's the driver. Yep. And so I kind of have this analogy where if you're like, you know, taking turns at super fast speeds and if you're just like, you know, driving recklessly, then you're probably going to end up in a gutter somewhere sooner or later. Um, by the same token, if you're really shy and, you know, you inch out onto the edge of your driveway and then inch back, you know, then nothing's going to happen for you there either. Um, and so it's always the people that are most calm and collected that get from A to B and are most reliable drivers. Um, so it's the same thing with investing. And so uh, I kind of like all those little analogies, I reckon they're the most important things when you like, especially if it's someone who's just starting out, like they've got like a pool of funds and they're like, what should I do with this money? Like, how should I invest it? They don't know the jargon because often that jargon is there to keep people away um, from the industry and to keep them from doing like they want you to hand your money over to somebody else who's a so-called professional. Yep. Um, but really no one's going to look after your money as well as you do. So. And so you, you uh, mentioned jargon there a little bit. And so 
you talk about investing and trading. Mm. Can you give us a bit of a rundown on the clear differences for someone who doesn't understand? Yeah, cool. So uh, for some people, it's the same thing. But for me, I kind of like, I have them in two different groups. Uh, for investing, that's kind of like the more longer term, um, like kind of the, the safety bucket. Like that's kind of where you would say like, I want to trade like Warren Buffett does. Like I want to find a company that I would love to own myself and just buy into it. And I don't really care what happens from the day-to-day aspect. Like I don't care if, you know, it's up 2% today and down 1% the next day. Like I just want to see long-term growth. I want to be involved in something that's like long-term sustainable in a good company. Like, and that's kind of how Warren Buffett does it. And, and you know, certainly a big inspiration for me sure. uh, because that is the kind of investing where you take a bit more of a sniper approach. You sit back, you wait for the right time and you buy when it makes sense. And, uh, you know, you might plan on never selling, uh, like, you know, Warren Buffett very rarely exits a position um, that he has chosen to invest in a long term. Yep. Um, so that's kind of like in the investing side. And then the trading side is more kind of like the short term, um, you know, kind of after a quick kind of capital gain. Um, and this can be anything from day trading, which is like you sit there watching the market all day, or it's like position trading or swing trading where you're waiting for the price to bounce or, uh, you know, hit a low and then come back up again and you want to trade like that movement when it starts to change direction. Um, that's kind of, you know, short-term trading uh, as well as anything to do with like, I like to do a lot of options trading. Um, so writing options, getting passive income from the share market that way. Can you explain what the options trading is? Yeah. So uh, it's kind of like, I do this thing called writing covered calls, um, which is like a, a well-known option strategy for people who are already like options. But in essence, the simplest way to put it is you have some shares that you own and you're renting them out for a monthly income. So, uh, you know, a share that's trading at $50, you might uh, write a, an option on the shares for $55 for that month and you'll get paid uh, regardless of what, sh what happens with those shares. Um, you'll get paid an, in uh, an income for that month just because you have essentially rented out your right to profit from those shares at anywhere above $55. Um, and so what that is, it's kind of like you're kind of selling off the future potential capital gain in exchange for guaranteed monthly income. Sure. Um, and so like when we're looking at, you know, passive income strategies and that sort of stuff, like that's probably one of my favorite uh, strategies to do. And uh, probably one of the things that I, I started doing and have never kind of stopped really. So, so, yeah. so essentially, because obviously everything has an upside and a downside, yep. the upside is the the consistent passive income, but the downside is that you may make less than you may have done if you held on to it yourself. Yeah, that's right. So if you uh, have, have like chosen a really good stock and that stock goes up to like a hundred dollars, you would have doubled your money. Um, and of course, yeah, that's a risk that obviously you have to take because in the market, there's no free lunch. There's always a trade-off. Sure. So what is the trade-off for you? And I guess it depends on your investing goal because if your goal is to get passive income and get a regular monthly income coming in, then you don't really care about the capital gain side. And you've shown that by, you know, sacrificing a portion of that. Um, the way it works with uh, trading covered calls is because if the price does go up and you're forced to sell your shares to somebody else, then at least you're still doing it for a small profit anyway. Sure. Um, and so that's kind of the attractiveness behind that aspect. Obviously, if you want a capital gain and you think it's going to go up real, real fast and sharply, you probably wouldn't do that. You probably just hold the position or something like that. Sure. Mm -hmm. And for someone who's starting out, do you uh, do you recommend a balance between these two and uh, you know between long-term investing to sort of mitigate the down risk and something more risky to make yeah. potentially better profit? Yeah, I, I, I kind of, like for me, that's that's how I like to do it. I kind of like have to, like, I kind of like having these two different buckets, one of them being the longer term, like kind of like the portfolio man managed side of things. Um, and then another one where it's just like, I'm just doing small trades that will pay me every month. Um, and so that's like a guaranteed income. And then this bucket here is like, we're just, leaving that there and seeing what happens. And so like if you're, you know, funding your own investment account, you can just like, you can allocate that evenly or depending on your goals. Like if you 
don't really want to spend a lot of time watching the market, you might go more into the investing side and less onto the trading side. Or if you really like the action and you find it a little bit exciting, you might do less of the investing and more of the trading. So it really just personal preference mostly. Sure. Um, yeah, for sure. And because on that uh, on that risk side, as you've said, you, you know, you've found yourself in a bit of trouble with that before. Uh, and we know... Uh, there's been a few highlighted challenges with, say, COVID and, and ASX volatility and yep. people trying to time the market. Yeah. Does that, is that some, sort of a skill that you can develop over time, not to time the market necessarily because the market will do what the market yeah, yeah, will yeah. do, yeah. But, to, but to mitigate that downside and take a more measured approach? Absolutely, yeah. So uh, like I always say, no one's got a crystal ball. And uh, if there was someone who knew exactly what the market was going to do at any time, like, they'd be richer than God, you know, yeah. like yeah. it's just how it works. But what you can do is you can improve your odds. Um, and to do that, you can r mitigate risk. Uh, and I talk about it ad nauseum in my book, uh, just because like, I feel like that is one of the most important parts uh, to master. Like if you're going to quote Warren Buffett, he had the two rules. Rule number one, don't lose money. Rule number two, never forget rule number one. Yep. Um, and so if we're going to take a leaf out of his book, then uh, number one for me is just all about capital protection. And so what I like to do is if I'm in a position, whether I'm trading or investing, I like to have something in place, like some kind of insurance in place where if the market takes like a huge dive, like, you know, something COVID happens or, you know, another uh, 2008 crash or something even bigger, maybe sure. I want to know that I'm safe and I'm protected and I want a good night's rest at night, you know, too. So a couple of things that I do is there's these things called stop losses that you can get um, where you have an automatic order sitting there in your trading platform where if the price goes down, um, let's say it goes 10% real sharply, I'll close out of my trade automatically. Sure. Um, there's also insurance. So you can actually insure your stock portfolio. A lot of people don't know, uh, but it's called a put option. And sometimes really inexpensively, you can get these options that basically give you uh, the right to sell your shares um, for what you paid for them at, uh, regardless of how much or how badly they tank, um, which is just absolute gold for someone who wants to protect their position and wants to kind of go through their investing career, not really worried or, you know, getting a restless night uh, because, you know, anything could happen at any moment. And we know that stocks, you know, do and can crash um, at any time. And so having that peace of mind is often worth it. And even uh, hopefully it's like insuring your car. Hopefully we don't need the insurance, yeah. but it's nice, nice to, to have, have if you do. And uh, obviously like that insurance becomes very expensive if the car is already on fire. Yep. Yeah. So, Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. It's a good, position, good way to put it. Yeah. Uh, so obviously you're an advocate for uh, people taking control and, yes. uh, and getting stuck in and having a crack at this sort of thing. Do you think there's ever a scenario where you maybe wouldn't recommend it and, uh, that they should just kind of, you know, hand that to someone who does know what they're doing so they can focus on where their passions are or, or what they're good at? Yeah, I think that if you're a very emotional person, um, then trading is not your thing. Sure. Um, obviously, that can be managed and uh, you can work on that, but uh, emotion is the enemy of trading and investing. Um, it's usually like if we look at where I was, I was impatient and I just wanted to get rich real fast. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was emotional trading. You know, I was overexposing myself because I wanted a result quicker than I, you know, was, was realistic. So, yeah, uh, Emotion has really no place in trading whatsoever. And the more you can make trading mechanical and do it from a calmer, more objective perspective, um, the better it's going to be for you. Like if you look at, again, Warren Buffett, he's one of the calmest looking guys that exist on the planet. And uh, that's how he operates because he's always the calmest guy in the room. He's always in control. Um, so yeah, if you find that like a news announcement, like another COVID or another, you know, something comes and rattles the market. If you find that that also rattles you, then that's the time to stay out. Yeah, I mean, certainly cro sure. crossing fingers and, and hoping isn't going to make the stocks go back up. Never so, works. I've tried it. <laughs> yeah, need to need to certainly go uh, go on the data. So uh, I know that uh, you have a few bits of uh, content out around myth busting investing. 
Yes. And uh, can you give us a like maybe one or two tidbits about probably you know the biggest myths that you think you can bust in this? Yeah. Area? So uh, one big thing that you've heard probably constantly is um, if you want to be a good investor, you've got to diversify. And um, for for me, I found that that is a kind of like it's almost. It's kind of like something that's been said over and over and over again, and no one really understands what it means. Um, the idea behind it is that you don't want to keep all your eggs in the one basket. But then what happens is when you start to trade that way, when you are right about a particular stock, you're in it for such a small amount that it doesn't really do what you're hoping that it does, which is, you know, get you to the next level of wealth that you're trying to get to. Sure. But when a market crashes, it typically takes the whole fleet down with it. Um, so in a, in terms of like safety, there are better ways to be safe. And we talked about those earlier, stop losses, getting put options, like insuring your position. Like those are ways that you can control your own investment. You don't really have to like spread yourself so thinly out. Um, and so a lot of people think that, you know, because I'm diversified, I'm covered. Uh, but, you know, something like 2008 happens again or even COVID for a brief moment there like that affected every single stock almost. Um, and so it didn't matter how diversified you were, uh, you were in it for such a small amount. Um, so like, yeah, it, in terms of safety, didn't really help. But then in terms of growth, doesn't really help much there either. So I find it's better to focus on one particular stock or one particular strategy um, and uh, really just do like your homework on that stock, like stalk the company, stalk the management, you know, do everything that you can to understand everything about that business. Yep. And then you can make a really, really informed decision, especially if you're on the investing side where like more longer term approach, like really act as if you're going to own a portion of this company because that's effectively what you're doing. And does that come from... Uh, again, obviously Warren Buffett's a pretty big inspiration for you and yeah. we know that he basically reads annual reports all day long. Yeah. <laughs> and is that is that where that kind of comes from? That's yeah. Similar thinking? Yeah, very similar thinking. So he will sit back and he might not pull the trigger on that particular stock for years until finally it becomes a stock where, you know, some news announcements come out that doesn't did, did not really actually impact how the company was run overall, but it affected the stock price. And then he goes, ah, there's a bargain. And bargain hunting is something that I think uh, kind of it gets a little bit lost in translation on you know Wall Street and that sort of stuff. Because when I was touring in the States, we just had Thanksgiving dinner at a friend's house and we rock up at this Walmart and I'm like, I'm just going to go inside and I need to buy some shades, right? I, need, I lost my sonny's at the last show. I need sure. to go buy some more. So I walk in there and it's a madhouse. There are people everywhere. You can't move through the aisles. It's just so packed. I'm like, what is going on? What is happening? I didn't realize uh, my, you know, uh, kind of ignorant self didn't realize that it's a Black Friday sale. They have it after every Thanksgiving sure. in, in the United States. And I was just caught in this trap of people and people are pushing and shoving each other and just like, <laughs> man, I, I, I just, it was a spectacle to me. It's the first time I've ever seen it. And I was taking photos and everything. And it made me realize that when there's a sale on, most people understand the value of a good sale because here they are crowding the shops. But when Wall Street has a sale, it's crickets. Like it's doom and it's gloom and everyone's saying stay away from the market, but that's where all the best deals are, Interesting. you know? And so like, you know, for regular things like a TV or a phone or something like that, well, people will trample over each other to get a good deal. But when it comes to their finances, it's like, I don't, I don't, I, it's crickets and I don't understand. Um, and so, I, but that's a phenomenon that happens like all the time and people just, I think, again, it comes down to emotion. People get scared when markets go down. But really, those are the most exciting times because you can get a good deal on a company that, you know, is really, really still good fundamentally. Yeah, of course. And obviously, uh, you know, the decisions that we make with our finances can have huge long-lasting impacts uh, over time for good and for bad. Yeah. Uh, like for someone just getting started, how do they uh, really anchor themselves to sort of try and mitigate that risk, you know, while still driving good growth and you know, good futures. Yeah. So I believe it comes down to two things. Number one, work on your own mindset. 
And I know this is a bit lame saying this because, you know, it's a business podcast. and It's people, a bit woo-woo maybe, but it's true. It's a little bit. Yeah. But if we can agree that our actions are based on how we think, then our actions are the things that are going to determine whether or not we are good traders or not. Absolutely. So it just makes sense that yep. that is, the, you know, the a logical step. Um, so if you can control your emotion and control how you're thinking and just be calm in the face of potential danger when it comes to finances, I think that's probably step number one. And then step number two, if, you, if you're getting started, do a simulated trading account, like a demo account, like play with fun money um, because most broker platforms offer that. And it's so just... It's so valuable because you can trade your strategy or the way that you think it should be done and see if it works, like test it and test it again and you know, do that for a couple of months if you have to. Because what that does is it builds your own confidence. It builds your own uh, you know, opinion on how well your strategy is working. And um, you can do it all risk free and you can get started. Like even if you don't have any money right now, you could start a trading account with paper money now get good while you build that nest egg. Um, and so I've, I've, that's the best thing. And, and, and even me to this day, if I'm on a new broker's platform for the first time and getting used to things, I'll do everything on a paper account first. And I might do that for a whole month. So it's a bit, a bit like playing Monopoly, but with it's, tangible it, results. That's right. And and that, it, it just, that is the best way to learn because simulations are... Uh, you know, we learn just as much from simulations as we do from doing the real thing almost. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. That's how they train pilots still, right? Exactly. So, yeah. So yeah. Trade like a pilot. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so uh, I, I do agree with the mindset and, uh, and I think it is really pivotal to any good uh, business or personal strategy that deals, especially with high risk situations, mm. but we can get a little bit caught up in being say too optimistic and, yeah. And does does that can can that cross over into crossing your fingers and hoping the stock will go back up as opposed to the data just being, you know, invalid? Yeah, that's true. And so what happens is sometimes uh, a lot of people will do all the right things. They will find a company that has great fundamentals and they'll time it perfectly. Like they'll look at the chart and they'll be like, yes, there's, you know, the Fibonacci's are lining up or whatever, you know, <laughs> sequence you've got sure. going on, but it'll still turn against them. And even though they've done their homework correctly and checked all the boxes, it still doesn't go the way we think it's going to go. And that's just the market. That's just how it works. But I think the best way to combat that is to obviously, again, risk mitigation, make sure that you're not overexposed on any one particular trade. But then the other thing is you've got to realize that it's a numbers game overall. Like that data that you are referring to, it takes a while for that. Like, you know, you might have to do a hundred trades before you start to see like exactly what your strategy is doing. Yep. Um, Cause there's things like recency bias and that sort of stuff where we look at it and like we, the first two didn't go well. So we're like, this doesn't work, but the next 98 might've gone perfect. Um, so yeah, it's definitely um, like you said, it's a, it's a way of thinking about it. Uh, that determines how well it does. And so the data is important. Like really the data is everything because that's where, that's the thing that tells you exactly what's going on. And so, you know, you can cross your fingers and pray and hope as much as you want, but it never moves the needle in the market one single little bit. So you kind of got to realize that certain parts are out of your control, but there's a lot that's still in your control and it all has to do with your mindset, your strategy, your timing, and uh, making sure that, you know, if trade isn't doing what you want it to do, just exit out. And, you know, if you've done everything else right, then uh, it won't be, you know, it won't be such a harsh lesson for you. So it sounds like it's really a game in being objective and, and not letting that confirmation bias creep in and, and skew the perspective uh, that yes, you've got. Yes, I'd say that's probably 80% of the work is uh, is just making sure that you know you remain mechanical in your trading and just yeah read the numbers let that give you and a gut feel probably has a little bit to do with it sure. because I've, I'm of the belief that we know a lot more than we give ourselves credit for um, but by the same token gut feel I think is different from emotion um, you know instincts are very powerful things whereas emotion kind of decreases our intelligence. So knowing to tell the difference between the two, I think is probably pretty important. And uh, that's probably a journey that I will always be on just understanding that like, you know, it, it sounds a bit, you know, Sun Tzu a little bit, but that's kind of like, know thyself, 
and uh, you'll become better in just about everything that you do, I reckon. Sure. Do you, do you think that uh, coming back to your touring and, and uh, the rock star side of uh, your life, mm. do you think that uh, that sort of acuity and, and intelligence around how decisions are made and uh, just get, having a different perspective on life that maybe you had prior to this investing career, do you think that uh, makes for better music or, uh, you know, just better outcomes on a tour? I feel like it does because since I've adopted this mindset, I've been a lot happier. Um, and when I'm happier, I write better songs. I make better decisions and I'm just like in a lot more like peaceful kind of mindset. And I don't know why that is exactly. I think maybe um, it's just I'm in my creative space a little bit more. Um, but it definitely plays a role like Sometimes there were years where I didn't write a song because I just had this constant writer's block and I had like, you know, foggy head and yeah. I just didn't really know what was going on. But I feel like the more I detach from a situation emotionally, it frees me up in some other area um, that lets me, you know, make better decisions and write better songs and connect with people. And I guess it com always comes back to like focusing less on myself and what others might think of me and focus more on what I can do for other people. Like I'm writing songs now that are a lot less for me and more for, well, how can I inspire someone to do something else? Sure. Or how can I help somebody else out of a tight spot? Or, you know, if I was, you know, down in the dumps and I wanted to hear an inspiring song, what would that song be? And it's kind of like, it, yeah, it's just opened my eyes a little bit more um, in general. Just, yeah, that kind of, that kind of way of thinking. Cool. But, uh, Not to sound woo-woo, but it's just, yeah, I, I've noticed the result. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, I, I do enjoy the perspective, absolutely. So we're starting to come up on time, but I do have a few uh, quicker questions that, I've, that I'd love to uh, get yeah. out. Um, one thing that I did pick up in your book, which I'm going to read off here so I don't muck it up, yeah. but if you don't quit, uh, if you don't quit, you end up winning, period. Thinking about that across your career, how does that contrast with when the odds are stacked against you and maybe the outcome won't be desirable and you need to know when to fold your cards? Yeah, so I have this kind of uh, theory that anything that happens to you is actually happening for you. So even like we were you know, broke, homeless, living in Los Angeles out of the van, that was an experience that gave more than it took from me. And I say that because... I really believe that anything that can help you grow and push your comfort zone uh, is important. And any time that you can persevere in the face of those overwhelming odds, um, you actually grow and become better. Uh, so when you're like, you know, whether you're investing, whether you're doing anything in business or, you know, trying to be a rock star or anything like that, you just got to look at it as though if you don't quit, that means you learn something. So there's no failure if you learn from those mistakes that are made. If you learn from that experience um, and keep applying it, then eventually you're just going to keep, you know, you're going to reverse those odds eventually because you're going to know how to make your own luck. You're going to know more about yourself and about the industry that you're in. And it's just, yeah, it's just a matter of time. So it's more about a long-term view than a uh, applicable to a particular trade where you just need to bail. Yes, that's right. Yeah, absolutely. If the ship is sinking, don't be on it. That's yeah. it. That is <laughs> certainly, certainly good advice. Yeah. Um, if you had to pinpoint, uh, say, the single biggest money lesson that you've learnt that you could share with our listeners, what would that be? Single biggest money lesson. It'll, it'll just be, again, know thyself and control your own thoughts, like realize that you are the master of your own thoughts. And um, once you get that, you can do anything. You can become anyone that you need to be. And so I kind of, uh, one thing that I've been reading a lot of now kind of recently is about thought control and how minding your own mind uh, and observing your own thoughts is one of the most powerful skills that you can have. And what that means is you can decide where to steal, where to steer the ship uh, when it comes to your finances or really anything in life. Like it's kind of like a universal principle, but how you do one thing is how you do everything. And so if you've got control and discipline, that's going to be the thing that moves the needle 
for yourself the most in finance. Interesting. Mm. And so uh, lastly, with uh, COVID right now, touring is a bit of a challenge, but sounds like you're eager to get back. And obviously investing and touring can go hand in hand. Yes. So what's uh, next on the plans for, for what you're doing? Next thing, I'm going to finish writing uh, my next album. Um, and I'm going to book a tour as soon as I'm allowed to. So <laughs> I've just been champing at the bit. I can't wait to get back on the road, uh, both in Australia and back in the USA. I know I've got a lot of US uh, friends and fans that I'm dying to see again. Amazing. Can't wait. It's going to be awesome. Uh, so, yeah, uh, just waiting for the world to be a little bit less crazy. But uh, it'll happen. That's really it'll cool. Happen. And so we are out of time, but uh, Nick Roberts, where can people find more about you? Where can they grab your book and where can they connect with you? Awesome. So, yep, uh, therockstarinvestor.com. That's the best place to go, therockstarinvestor.com. And, uh, yeah, get a free copy of my book there and uh, you'll laugh, you'll cry, it'll change your life. Amazing. Absolutely. <laughs> I thoroughly enjoyed uh, what I have read and uh, I'm sure our listeners will as well. Nick awesome. Roberts, thanks so much for coming. Thanks, mate. Cheers. There you have it. I hope you really enjoyed this episode. And if you did, please like it, share it, or leave us a review on your favorite platform. It helps us show more of this content to people just like you.